Let's let's talk about um, the uh, uh, the question of, of foreign policy specifically towards Israel, which, um, you know, I, I don't know at the end of the day, we'll ever be able to assess how much of that was um, how much that contributed to Joe Biden stepping aside. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I don't think it was the primary reason. I think the primary reason was, you know, it had to do with uh, polling showing that the people felt he was too old. I think there were probably other reasons that maybe other members of like the, the democratic establishment had, but it certainly, um, it certainly was a reason and there certainly was, it created headwinds, you know, maybe if everything else was perfectly fine with him, it wouldn't have made a difference, but it wasn't. And so this added, this was another straw, which one, you know, broke his back. We don't know. Um, what, um, where should we, uh, okay. And so in the wake of, of that, there was a sense of like, okay, genocide Joe is gone from, uh, you know, from the perspective of, of, a, a fairly significant part of the activist base of, of, of Democrats. I mean, 50 percent of Democrats think it's a genocide, by the way. And and I my sense was always, you know, the first order problem may be the votes that you lose over this. Um, but the bigger problem was the lack of enthusiasm. It's just hard for activists to get out there and do activism and get out the vote if they are only like, three quarters on board or half on board because they, they're weighed down by their conscience. I mean, that I think was a, a big underrepresented factor, but what, um, w in the wake of that comma Harris, we don't know what her position is on this. You know, we saw she boycotted basically the, the Netanyahu speech, um, she had come out for a ceasefire earlier than anybody else, but it was sort of like a ceasefire with an asterisk. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have this, we have that clip, which clip yeah, are you talking is, about? This is interesting to me. And I'm curious about your take, Crystal, because, you know, both of our shows, I think we've been laser focused on Gaza and alleviating this genocide um, and, and putting an end to this. And the Biden administration continues to pursue these ceasefire talks that have been, it's been clear since October 6th what the incentive is for Netanyahu. Like, his governing coalition, not the war cabinet, the one that keeps him in power, is the far right. And he also doesn't want to stay out of power outside of ideology because of these corruption investigations. And so he has no incentive to de-escalate tensions. And the... He's been just like now basically sabot sabotaging these ceasefire talks and the Biden administration won't budge on arms. But I so I found this really notable on Chris Hayes last night. Ben Rhodes, uh, who used to be in the Obama administration, was one of the most vocal people for the Iran deal, which is like, OK, you're a better Democratic foreign policy right. person than the West exec ghouls overseeing this genocide. If that's your position, right. Phil Gordon, her uh, national security advisor in the administration, but still works for the president. I just want to be clear on this. He's assistant to the president and national security advisor for the vice president. So like very limited in what Phil Gordon is going to say publicly. It's he can't contradict the administration. But Ben Rhodes, they work together. They're both pro Iran deal people. And Chris Hayes had Rhodes on last night. And this is what he said about. Well, let's let's policy. before we play that, yeah. let's show Phil Gordon's tweet. So that yes. we can contextualize because this, in terms of like uh timeline, um, and this is where all the stories are getting built around this Phil Gordon tweet. Um, but put this up, uh, Bradley. It this says, is, VP, yeah, VP has been clear. She will always ensure Israel is able to defend itself against Iran and Iran backed terrorist groups. She does not support an arms embargo on Israel. She will continue to work to protect civilians in Gaza and to uphold international humanitarian law and you can see on the right there it says assistant to the president and national uh, security advisor to vice well, president the vice president I, and i just want to point out here and and you know there may be a little bit of like uh you know uh parsing associated with this but keep that keep that up bradley um is these are these are this can be read you know this is this is very nuanced and and uh, I am uh, open to criticism that I am reading too much in this. 
She's clear she'll always ensure Israel is able to defend itself against Iran and Iran-backed terrorist groups. Not Israel will always, uh, she will always ensure that Israel is able to fight back and defend itself, period, because that has been the justification in terms of like their assault on Gaza. This is very specific. Defend herself against Iran and Iran-backed terrorist groups. Um, she does not support an arms embargo on Israel. That seems clear. So that's off the table. Then it's separate thought she will continue to work to protect civilians in Gaza and uphold international humanitarian law. You know, there's a conflict there. Uh, there's a potential conflict there. And um, it's it's conceivable. You know, this, this is very sort of like a diplomatic uh, language. But and it's easy to read. You know, this, there's a bit of a Rorschach test here. But with that said, let's play this clip because. Um, as Emma's saying, Ben Rhodes here is in May, in some respects, could be interpreted as like sort of filling in some of this. And, you know, everything should be taken with a grain of salt. I still remember uh, Austin Goolsby going up to Canada and telling people Barack Obama is actually not going to get us out of NAFTA. So don't worry about a thing. But um, but here we go. I think it's incredibly unlikely, Chris. I mean, the reality is that oh, plan is A has ceasefire. been exactly what you described, plus a kind of Saudi normalization of Israel that could unlock some kind of peace process. Um, look, the decision makers in those negotiations right now on either side are Bibi Netanyahu from Israel, who can't even stand behind the same Israeli ceasefire position that the administration has lifted up. Every time they get close to a deal, Netanyahu says something that essentially upends the process. And the decision maker, particularly since the assassination of Hania, the leader of Hamas, decision maker of Hamas is Yahya Sinwar, who's the most militant yes. leader of Hamas sitting in Gaza. And so those are the people that would have to agree to masterminded this. the October 7th attacks. I mean, this was his project, yes. Exactly, right? And so, and even if you got a ceasefire for a period of weeks, and this is something I think people have to reflect on, that's not the end of the story. Netanyahu said, uh, well, we'll do this for six weeks and then we'll go back in and resume what we're doing to try to destroy Hamas. He also said in his speech before Congress, we don't accept anybody else coming in to run Gaza. We have to have kind of de facto security administration, security control over Gaza. So no matter what happens, the next president is likely to inherit a situation where Gaza is destroyed. There's huge humanitarian uh, challenges. Even if there's some kind of ceasefire in place, there's going to be an open question about who kind of administers Gaza. And so that's kind of where we are. The best case scenario is that they get some kind of deal that returns some hostages, get some calm, get some aid in. But that still doesn't answer these kind of big questions that are outstanding. Now, arms embargo that she shot down or that Phil Gordon shot down, you know, that's the most extreme version of cutting off all military assistance. Arms embargo, though, doesn't to define all the options. You can withhold certain offensive military systems to try to press Israel to stop its military operations. That's, I think, what a lot of people have wanted to see is just the utilization of U.S. leverage to compel a ceasefire to get its humanitarian assistance in. Um, she's obviously not going to unpack all of this in public. It's good that she's sitting down and listening to the uncommitted voices, because one way to bring the party together here, and I think Joe Biden could have done more of this, is to hear those voices, to take those concerns seriously, and to make it clear that there'll be, you know, a seat at the table for them to express their views. So, I mean, so yeah, yeah, there. I mean, there is now. Again, this is you know, uh, uh, I will I will concede. Uh, part of this is sort of like you know aspirational on my part. But Rhodes is out there saying there are not, you know, you, a, a complete arms embargo is one thing, you know, cutting off Iron Dome and all these other things is, is off the table. But he's saying, like, you know, conditioning weapons on a ceasefire and is is on the table. And he says clearly, you know, like she's not going to she's not going to do this stuff in public, which, of course, um, makes a lot of sense. I don't even think in private it would make sense to, for her, you know, for uh, Netanyahu to walk away with a sense that like, she's absolutely going to bring the hammer down because then the guy attacks Iran the next day. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, so a couple things, first of all, obviously her response to the protesters completely sucked and was yep. tone deaf and morally outrageous. And actually Biden with protesters did a better job. And I think it showcases some of her political 
faults, not only with regards to this issue, but specifically when she's caught off guard is when she tends to be at her worst. So she, and you picked up on this right away, Emma, she reverted to this like girl boss power stance that she used against Mike P- Pence because that was like what she had in her bag of tricks. Mr. So, Vice President, I'm speaking. She I'm tried speaking. Why yeah. use that in this context? Yeah. Right. So that sucked. So let's just be really clear about that. But I mean, my cynical view of Kamala Harris is, as I said before, you know, my baseline position is she doesn't really have any strong ideological commitments to anything. And but I think Biden is really out of step with the mainstream normie position in the Democratic yes. Party. I mean, you had even Nancy Pelosi signing on to a letter that said we need to withhold arms. So all that I can reasonably hope for from Kamala Harris is that she will behave like a normal Democrat who at this point thinks very poorly of Bibi Netanyahu and sees him as, you know, a right wing partisan figure and that she will respond to political pressure in a way that Joe Biden was not willing to because of his deep-seated ideological commitment to Zionism. He was willing to, you know, show political courage and risk his re-election to back this genocide. And my hopes for Kamala are not that high. You know, she's not going to turn into Rashida Tlaib. That's not what I expect. What I expect is that she will have a more Obama-esque political position that she would not have embraced if it was her. She wouldn't have done this absolutely foolish and outrageous bear hug strategy. Yep. And that she will put her finger in the wind and realize that continuing in this direction is an utter political disaster for her and her own ambitions. That's my highest expectation. And I think it's a reasonable expectation given what we know about her, what we have seen her say, what we have seen her do, et cetera. So that's where I'm coming from. And you know, the, the choice of walls is really important here as well. Because even though I know that Gaza was not the only issue that was considered, I do think that it was a part of the calculus. And on the one hand, you have a candidate who I think, given his long stated track record and uh, his writings and what he's the way he's spoken, and especially the way he spoke about campus protesters in the context of this current conflict, I think Josh Shapiro is a sort of ideologically committed Zionist who may be willing to pay a price to stick with that long held belief versus Tim Wells, who, you know, had some really positive and um, empathetic things to say about the uncommitted movement. And while he also is a standard Democrat on the issue, again, he's not Rashida Tlaib. There also isn't a track record of demonstrated ideological willing to risk my own political capital to stick with this Netanyahu driven project of Zionism. So that's kind of how I'm looking at it. I don't think people like Really, and I agree with you completely. I, we criticized her response yesterday, especially because she's going to need to be more concrete. I mean, like the, this this going to Chris Hayes and having Ben Rhodes kind of say, OK, she will shift a little. It's not going to be sufficient, I think, for a lot of yeah. people. And that's exactly why the pressure should continue. Like, that's why these well, protests should continue. I, and and she's still probably because of the practical diplomatic realities that Sam describes It's not going to be sufficient what she comes out with before the election. But I do think that that's all warranted and great and like uh, 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 democratic and what needs to happen in the midst of this uh, of this process. But to your point, like people underestimate how horrible Biden is on this issue, like horrible ideologically. Peter Beinhart wrote in 2020 about how Biden sabotaged tougher negotiations with Benjamin Netanyahu by circumventing Obama and Hillary Clinton as secretary of state to go and like use his personal relationship with this genocidal maniac um, to undercut Obama's policy. Uh, In the 2020 primaries, I think it was just Buttigieg, um, Warren, Bernie and Biden left at this point. Uh, or at the very least, they're the ones who answered the question in the, de- in the debate. It was, would you condition aid to, to Israel? Because I think at, at, at issue here were, you know, the illegal settlements. And but of those four, Biden was the only one who said absolutely not. So, mm, like, that's interesting. It's getting I think it's really getting because Democrats don't want to contradict the sitting president in public. And they also have all these like concerns about 
We don't want this is a fluid situation. We don't want a regional war to uh, break out. The ceasefire talks, they're right around the corner. Just trust us. Like, don't rock the boat. I think that the general public or the people really invested in this issue may be surprised when Biden is no longer the leader of the party, where the, if that the party moves towards a rational policy for their own skin. This is not about what's in their hearts for their own political futures based on where the base is. That is like what I'm trying to get through to people, I think, about not Kamala Harris being Bernie Sanders or AOC or Rashid, Rashid Tlaib, but her being someone who responds to rational incentives as opposed to a guy who like, I don't know, his brain barely works and he's still just a reflexive anti-Palestinian racist. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, listen, uh, Mark Lamont Hill said this about Joe Biden. I think this is really true, too, is in his 50 years or whatever in Washington, it has never been the wrong political move to be too pro-Israel. And so when you're dealing with someone who is, you know, very elderly and his positions and views of the world were locked in in some 1970 whatever visit to see Golda Meir, he was not going to change. Like it's ossified. It's locked in. And um, he was not nimble enough to really evaluate or even understand the shifting political calculus that's very clear. And so, you know, no one has done more to make uh, support of the, you know, overall project of Israel a partisan affair than Bibi Netanyahu. I mean, this starts under the Obama administration when he comes and speaks to Congress to block, attempt to block the Iranian nuclear deal. It's no secret to anyone that he wants Donald Trump to win the election. And so, again, I think if you just have like a, a normal, you know, relatively nimble political thinker who's evaluating the landscape as it exists today, you know, how do you look at like a video of their main political program where they're arguing that rape should be systematized against Palestinians and think that this is a country that we should be wholly throwing our lot in with. Um, so that's why, you know, again, I'm, I'm, my hopes are very tempered. I'm not expecting a, a radical change, yeah. but I just think a clear eyed view of the political calculus from a normal Democrat, a normal self-serving, self-interested Democrat at this point would have taken a very different approach. The, the thing that's very dangerous right now is, you know, you mentioned we're, we're still waiting for whatever the Iranian retaliation is going to be after the, the latest provocation from Israel. And uh, we talked to Dr. Trita Parsi on breaking points, and I think he's right about this. He says, you know, part of the calculus for Bibi is now that Kamala has a chance at winning and he fears she might shift direction somewhat, he wants to lock her in and box her in. That's, to that was exactly, that was exactly Exactly, you know, uh, my point earlier was that, you know, if there isn't a potential in in Netanyahu's mind that um, she will not sort of like uh, uh, inhibit Israel so much that uh, Netanyahu is exposed, it's all all of his incentive structure is I got to bomb Iran right now. And yeah. start this thing. And, I got to drive them all the way in. War. Yep. Because I mean, we saw what happened with Afghanistan, withdrawing from war. Even when the public says they, they want out of this war, we've been doing this for decades. You know, Biden took a huge political hit yep. from withdrawing from Afghanistan. And that's why no one did it before. Because they knew it's easy for it to just fade into the background and no one except the people who actually have to go and risk their lives are thinking about it too much. And uh, yeah, so if we get dragged into some massive regional war, do I think Kamala Harris is going to have the like political courage to, to get us out of that and face all the attacks about her being weak and caving to Iran and blah, no. blah, blah? No, no, no. no I and, and, and to be clear, uh, you know, because she's a woman, the, this is like becomes a even more of a sort of like a, um, a, a narrative that is easier for people to um, build than they did around Biden. I mean, sure. had Harris overseen um, uh, the uh, leaving of Afghanistan, I, I think that would have been, you know, it, it that would still be on the nightly news. <laughs> They'd still be talking about it uh, as, as proof. I mean, I'm I'm old enough to remember when, like, uh, what was the name? Schroeder from uh, uh, Colorado. She cried. Uh, I don't know if it was like '88 or what it was uh, on the campaign, and that that was it. Done. Mm. Uh, the fact that they saw, like, you know, 
she, like one of these and she th that was it because of the narrative that she was a woman but all right so with all that said like mm -hmm. how does harris with the sort of uh understanding or at least the uh awareness that at best she's going to be replacement level a uh, democrat on uh israel which is you know better than biden because biden is Again, you know, it wasn't just, I think, I, you know, with all due respect to, to Mark Lamont Hill, it wasn't just that he practiced politics. 50 years ago, Menachem Begin reportedly had to say, whoa, you know, like uh, to him. And <laughs> Menachem Begin was like, you know, former member of the Ergun. Uh, you know, Biden was in many respects, you know, sort of sweet, generous within the Democratic Party, even in terms of like his uh, willingness to sort of like, allow Israel and encourage Israel to basically kill as many people as you need to, uh, to, to feel good about yourself. Um, yeah. but with that said, how does, with the understanding that Harris is going to be basically, you know, replacement level, uh, 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 Democrat on Israel, um, which I, I think replacement level would have been like, you got to end this or we're going to, we're cutting off, you know, all of your offensive material. You'll, you'll always get the iron dome type of thing. What does she need to do? What can she do as a candidate to, at the very least, indicate that without these sort of setting off these tripwires of like, you're not supposed to interfere with uh, your president's foreign policy, particularly if you're the vice president. Uh, wh wh what does she do in that instance? I mean, I think probably the direction to go in is to emphasize the commitment to international law. And, um, you know, the meetings that she's taking, I think that's really important. Um, but also, you know, with regard to like how she handled the protesters, she can say with credibility, that's why we support a ceasefire. We agree with you. We support a ceasefire. And I'm going to make sure that we get it done. I mean, that's not dissonant from Biden's policy, but it's a matter of emphasis and how you talk about it. Because, again, supposedly Biden's policy is he wants it to end. He wants there to be a ceasefire. And so Kamala Harris could really lean into, you know, that messaging. But I also, I don't know if I, like, he's a lame dunk at this point, you know, like she, she could create a little more separation. She could strike a bit more of her own court. We don't even hear from this guy. No one's even thinking about him anymore for better or worse. It's barely like he's president anymore. So I'm not sure that all the nervousness about like, oh, I don't even want to contradict him a little bit, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not sure that that's really that warranted. They are Democrat. She could deploy Tim Walls. Maybe. I don't know. Um, I, but yeah, I hear what you're saying. I want her to take a tougher stance on it, too. Um, I just also feel like there are these like diplomatic tripwires, as Sam says, that are difficult for us to assess, I think, from the outside. Um, but, but yeah, uh, and at least on the, at the very least, like I, I will say, I think she does have one ideological commitment because when she ran in 2020, she was running on a, uh, kind of childcare, uh, first platform. That was what she oriented herself towards in the primary, her connections with the SEIU, the care workers union in California, those are real. And that's part of why I'm encouraged, at least now we're back domestically, but with the selection of Walls and his work <laughs> with uh, school lunches in Minnesota, there's an ideological consistency with it, if she chooses to go down this path. We don't have a platform from her yet, but um, there is an ideological consistency that could be good and be a, a vision forward, I think, for the country, a positive one, family first school lunches, the paid family leave, all that kind of stuff that maybe I think she might actually have commitments to. I don't know if she has commitments to it, but I do think that that is most likely to be those sort of like left behind elements of build back better. I think that's what is most likely to be her domestic agenda. And I think that's great. You know, I think that's I think that would be an incredibly, I think it would be great electorally. I think it would be even more important for, you know, helping families and working people be able to just have like a little bit more ease in their lives. I don't know if you guys have been reading these stories about the Olympians at the uh, Olympic Village in Paris who are like booking all these healthcare appointments because it's yes. free. 
in the Olympic Village. And we're, of course, the only developed country who does it. Like, it's, you know, putting that sort of thing back on the table where we're once again talking about healthcare, we're talking about affordable childcare, we're talking about education. And obviously, Tim Walls is perfect messenger for all of those things. I think that is the most likely direction. And it'd be fantastic if she would, you know, really lean into that and lay that out um, very clearly. But, you know, with regard to, to go back to Sam's question, which I think is a challenging one on what could she say and how could she talk about this now in a way that's not going to, you know, just totally undercut the current president. I actually think she struck the right tone pretty effectively after her meeting with mm-hmm. Netanyahu, where she didn't undercut Biden's policy, but she was tough and she was clear, like she was not messing around with this guy. Um, She really emphasized her care and concern for Palestinians and, um, you know, for international law. And I think that's probably the the best that we could expect to get from her. In addition to Sam, your point is, is so correct about Biden, which is it's very clear. He just doesn't really see Palestinians as people. No, I I, I think it's, I, I, I don't think it's ever, it seems to have never occurred to him. And Peter Beinart, you know, uh, months ago said something at the beginning of the year, I think it was, said something to us. He's like, you can look at the way that people perceive the founding of America as a proxy in some respects or a predictor as to how they'll perceive like Israel as a project and their perception of the Palestinian people. If if there is a fundamental disavowal of the racist origins of this country, um, they will uh, it, they will also not see it in the context mm. of Israel. Well, mm. well Peter said uh, they're both uh, mythologies of promised lands on a hostile frontier, and there's nobody who buys more into like the most toxic parts of American exceptionalism right now, honestly, on the Democratic side with, in American politics than Biden, who romanticizes it to a level that is, I mean, grating and I think also toxic and 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 is is about a part of you know his long history of racism honestly yeah but i'm yeah. gonna go, 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 go nato yeah, yeah. god so. i miss the compelling, somber, compelling patriot, <laughs> the somber patriotism of the like I, why, we have not I heard to, enough about AUKUS, NATO. uh <laughs> the ki- kitchen table issue of finland joining into nato don't you understand i mean i'm personally i'm a single issue AUKUS voter myself <laughs> but you know i know that's not uh Majority position. No, I mean, uh, listen, with regard to, to Kamala, I think what I'm looking for, what I've, what I've been most hopeful about her is when it actually genuinely feels like she sees Palestinians as human beings. And the more she can do as, of that, the more, you know, I'll be persuaded she might be a little different, um, that she might just be sort of normie Democrat, might respond to the polls, et cetera. And I do think that the Tim Walls over Josh Shapiro pick was a, an important indication on that. So that's how I'm looking at it at this point. Yep. All right. Well, um, uh, Crystal, we get a lot of the stuff that we could have talked to you about, but uh, mm-hmm. we have run out of time. I should also say just uh, breaking news. Uh, the Biden administration lifted its ban on U.S. Uh, sales of offensive weapons to Saudi Arabia. And that um, is not a great thing in the context of the potential for a war uh with iran well there, uh, that means uh, that they feel they're close on uh on abraham accords right because the, they're it, giving I, they're giving defense promises to saudi arabia right in in exchange to normalize israel which who gives a crap or, about this or normalized they, relationship? or they think that they're going to send a signal to iran that um your number one uh, rival in the region is about to have uh you know basically uh you know one of those shopping sprees we go with the uh, shopping cart and go through their, their our, our military stores so um I, I guess we shall see but uh um uh, crystal uh really a pleasure thanks so much for coming on today we'll put a link to uh, Breaking Points, which, as you may know, you're the co-host of. <laughs> and uh, Crystal, Kyle, and Friends as well. Yes, so, that we'll too. do both. Can't forget yes. my husband. Yes. There you go. <laughs> All, right, All right. Thanks, guys. It was fun. Yep. Thanks, Crystal. Thanks, Crystal. Hey, folks, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and check out our daily show. We do it every day at 12 p.m. Eastern for about two and a half hours. We even take phone calls. You should check that out.